Um, but something we're going to be doing here that a, a lot of classes don't have the opportunity to do is we're just going to take a book from the Bible and we're going to go through it verse by verse, whether that takes us a year or whether it takes us two years or whatever it takes us to do, we're just going to go through and teach the Word of God in a, in a verse by verse method. Uh, actually, what we'll be doing is called expositional teaching or expository teaching. Uh, and basically, it just means you just take the Scripture and expose it. That's what that means. And, and you'll hear more and more about that as we, as we teach and as I ask questions and, and all those kind of things. And so we're going to begin with the book of Acts. With the book of Acts. And so if you want to go ahead and open your Bible or, or uh, use one of your devices, whatever, uh, that's great. But we're going to begin with the book of Acts. Um, and uh, we're going to take our time to go through the, uh, the book of Acts. Um, when I was uh, about to retire from the pastor, I was a, a pastor, <coughs> excuse me, for 45 years. And um, when I was about to retire from being a pastor, I had started going through the Gospel of Luke with our people in Tulsa. I was pastor of the South Tulsa Baptist Church. And we'd been going through the Gospel of Luke for several months and uh, maybe six or eight or ten, I'm not sure actually. But uh, anyway, I announced on Sunday morning that, uh, and we'd gone through all the process of retirement, getting ready for that. I announced that uh, I was going to be retiring in six months. And uh, so that was, that was like in June or something. And so in, in January, I was going to be retiring. And uh, after the service was over that morning, one of our great men came up to me. He said, Pastor, you're not going to retire in January. I said, oh, yeah, I am. I, he said, no, no, you're not going to retire in January. I said, yeah, his name was Pee Wee, he was a coach. I said, yeah, coach, I, I'm, I'm going to retire in January. He said, no, you're not. He said, you'll never be through with Luke in another six months. Well, there was some truth to that, but uh, we did get through, and, but we will take our time, okay? We won't be in any hurry and, uh, as, as we walk through. So, so we're going to begin uh, in the book of Acts, and I, and I want you to go ahead, if you would, and um, open your copy of the Bible uh, to the book of Acts. And in a moment, we're going to read the first 11 verses. But, but, but take a Bible marker or a card or something out of the pew rack there and stick it in Acts so that you have that. And then go with me over to the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. Okay, the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. Now, um, Luke writes the Gospel of Luke and also writes the book of Acts. So that's why we're going to look at Luke for just a moment, and then we'll jump into the book of Acts and really get into the meat of what we're going to talk about today. But Luke was not an apostle. He, he uh, probably met Paul, and there's one point in one of Paul's letters when Paul gives greetings to the physician Luke and that kind of thing. But we're going to see what he says in his gospel, which is very, very interesting. And so he writes the gospel of Luke, and then he writes the book of Acts. So I want you to look with me now uh, in the gospel of Luke. And, and, and Luke uh, probably wrote this gospel in the mid-60s A.D., okay? Mid-60s A.D. And then he writes uh, Acts from 65 to 70 A.D. So kind of get that in your mind. We've got about a 10-year period here that we're dealing with. But look with me now in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, okay? Look at this, and listen to these words. <clears throat> Luke writes, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. Now, now as, as Luke begins the Gospel of Luke, he says to us, and, and to a particular individual, which we'll talk about in just a moment, he says to us, he says, now, now I'm going to give you an account of what happened. I'm going to give you an account of what happened in the life of Jesus. I'm going to give you an account of the ministry of Jesus. And, and he says, this came from eyewitnesses. All right? So he's, he, he's, he's right up front. He's saying, I didn't acknowledge all these things. I didn't see all these things. But everything I'm telling you came from eyewitnesses. Everything I'm telling you came from people who saw it. All right? Now, now stay with me. He says, and just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word... Okay, now I, I believe that right there that, that word, word refers to Christ. 
I know it's not capitalized. And by the way, I'll be teaching from New American Standard Bible, okay? Um, and, and, but I think they were servants of the Word. John says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, okay? So Luke says, now everything I'm telling you came from eyewitnesses of people who were eyewitnesses and they served the Word. All right, so there's amazing truth now in, in what he's getting ready to share with us. Now, look in verse 3. And it seemed fitting to me as, as well, having invested, investigated everything carefully from the beginning. Okay, so, so, you know, Luke was a doctor. So he's a man of science. He's a man of investigation. He says, I, everything these eyewitnesses told me, I investigated carefully. Everything they said to me, I looked at very carefully. And he says, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, okay, so from the beginning of Jesus' life, from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order. All right, so he says, from the very beginning, I just, I just wrote these things, step one, step two, step three. So I wrote all these things in consecutive order from the beginning to write it out in consecutive order. Now look at this. Most excellent Theophilus. Okay, so we know now he's writing to some guy named Theophilus. And, and we get the benefit eventually of the Gospel of Luke being a part of the Scripture, and so we get to enjoy that. But he's writing to a guy named Theophilus. Uh, now, the word Theophilus, the name can mean lover of God. Uh, but, but notice he calls him excellent. Excellent Theophilus, which probably means that Theophilus was part of the Roman government. Now, there's a tradition, and, and I, I want you to hear that word, tradition. Uh, there's a tradition that Theophilus was the lawyer who represented Paul before Caesar. We don't know that for sure, but, but there is that tradition, okay? All right, so, so Luke is writing to this guy, Theophilus, and, he, and he's, now look at this. We'll go back to verse 3. It seemed fitting, fitting to me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Okay, so Theophilus is a believer. He's been taught. And, and Luke says to him, I wrote this gospel so that you, in a consecutive order, so you would know exactly everything that you've been taught. All right, now then, go with me over to Acts 1, okay? All right, now, it, it, and let me give you just a, a, a quick uh, summary of the Gospel of Luke. Luke starts with the birth of Christ, goes through the life of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the ascension. All right, that's where the ascension is where the Gospel of Luke stops. So the Gospel of Luke stops with the ascension. But remember, he said, Theophilus, I'm going to tell you, give you exact understanding of everything you've been taught in a consecutive order. So he starts with the birth. He goes through the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the ascension. And then he's through in teaching that gospel. All right, but now, sometimes later, sometime later, he writes this book that we know of as the Acts of the Apostles. Now, I like to call the book the Acts of the Holy Spirit in the Apostles and other believers. The Acts of the Holy Spirit in the, apostle, in the Apostles and, and other believers. Okay, now look at what Luke does now. Keep in mind, he's written to Theophilus, all right, now look at the beginning of Acts, and we're going to, I'm going to read these first 11 verses to you, and then we're going to begin to walk through them, okay? All right, now, the first account I composed, Theophilus. All right, now what was that? It was Luke, okay? The Gospel of Luke, all right? The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day... When he was taken up to heaven, after he, by the Holy Spirit, had given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. All right, so that's exactly what we saw. He went from his birth, his life, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and, and then the, the resurrection and the ascension. And now Luke says, and, and, and I wrote that 
um, until the day when he was taken up to heaven. All right, so he, he acknowledges, I stopped in my gospel at the ascension. That's where I stopped, all right? Now look at verse 3. To these, and we'll look at that in just a moment, but to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Okay, so, so, so here's a summary. Luke writes his gospel consecutively of all the things Jesus did. He gets to the end of his gospel... And he, and he talks about the ascension, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension. All right, now when he writes to Theophilus, the second account, the second book, he says, he says now, after, at, before the ascension, there were some things that happened. Jesus appeared to these folks. Jesus spoke to these folks. Jesus gave some orders to these folks. And then he ascended. So, so when you go to the end of Luke, he says he was ascended... And then you go to the beginning of Acts, and he gives you the details of that. So it's a, it's a beautiful account. So he says, the first account, I told you all about this, Theophilus. But now this second account. And so now we have this wonderful book of Acts, and all that the Holy Spirit did through the apostles and through other believers. So, so that's how all that comes together from Luke to Acts. Okay, now, here's, here's the, that, that was all introduction, okay? Here's what I want us to do now. Um, and I want to ask a question. Now, now something you want to kind of get in your mind as I teach, I'm always asking questions, okay? Don't, don't get bothered by that. Uh, in fact, one of the best ways to learn is to ask questions like who, what, why, when, and where. Who said that? Why did they say it? Where were they? When were they? Who else was there? So I'm always asking questions as I study and as I teach. But I also like to ask real practical questions. And, and, and I'll, never, I'll never ask a question to embarrass anybody. I'll never ask a question saying, okay, are we supposed to know that? You, you remember when you were in grade school and teacher asked a question and you were supposed to know it but you didn't? And you were hiding behind the person in front of you? Okay, don't worry about that. We're not going to ask questions that you and I are going to answer out loud, okay? But I do like to ask questions because it just helps me think. And, and I think it helps us think. And, and sometimes the Holy Spirit uses questions to kind of deal with my heart. So, so here's, here's a question. How can Jesus change us? How can, how can He change us? You know, um, I, was a, I was a pastor for 45 years. And, and, and I saw this kind of thing happen in the lives of people. Um, I, I'd see some people... Just grow in the Lord. Boy, and I mean, their spiritual life would just skyrocket. Man, they'd, they'd, they'd hear the Word of God, and they'd take that Word of God and apply it, and man, their lives changed. Uh, I was, was with a friend of mine uh, the day before yesterday and, and telling him about a, a, a young guy led to the Lord in Tulsa years ago. And man, that got to this day, that guy's life just continues to explode with the things of God. So, so I've seen that, and all of us have seen that. Okay, now, 
But then I've seen others who heard the Word of God, believed the Word of God, did, did, did everything that God's Word says to, by faith, trust Him as Savior, and yet their life just flatlines, just, just stays there. Nothing ever changes. Not, nothing really ever happens. And as a pastor, I used to say, why? What, what's that all about? Now, as I, I look personally at my life, there were times that, man, my spiritual life just exploded. And there are other times it flatlined. There are times that, that man, God's Word would speak to me, and it was like Jesus Himself just talking to me. And other times I could read and it just didn't, didn't go anywhere. What's the difference? And when you look at these people to, that, that, that Luke is referencing, man, their life changed amazingly. I mean, from the time that the Spirit of God comes into their life at Pentecost, I'm telling you, it was... It was Incredible. They really did turn the world upside down for Christ. So, so what I want to do in a real practical way for the next few minutes is I want us to walk through this passage of Scripture together in a real careful way because I think there's some keys in here concerning how Jesus can change us. And if, if you're like me today, you probably can say, well, boy, there's some areas that I need Jesus to change right now. There, there's some areas of my life that aren't like Christ. There's some areas of my life that absolutely need to change. So let's, let's walk through this, and you'll, you'll discover also that I'm very easy to outline, okay? Uh, if you want to keep a notebook or however you want to do that or write notes in your Bible, you'll discover that I'm very easy to do that. And also you'll discover I love word studies. I just absolutely love word studies. Now, I'm not... A Greek or Hebrew scholar okay been to seminary got a couple of seminary degrees but I'm not a Greek Hebrew scholar but I've worked real hard to learn how to use the helps and there are some amazing helps out there particularly today and I've worked really hard so so I love word studies okay so let's let's walk through here's the first truth out of all that that I finally want to get to uh, and how can Jesus change us Jesus authority must be accepted. His authority must be accepted. Now, if I were to go through this group of believers this morning and say, do we believe Jesus has authority? Every one of us would say, yes. But why do we believe that? And, and, and does he really have authority over us? I mean, you know, Scripture says... Uh, Love your neighbors, you love yourself. How are we doing with that? You know, how, how are we really doing with that? Uh, Jesus said, as I am holy, ye too be holy. How, how's that working for us? Well, well, if we really accepted Jesus' authority, that's one thing to know about Jesus' authority, then it's something else to accept that. To say, it's, it's mine. Now, now, I want you to see this. This is so interesting to me. Luke tells us something that Jesus did before he was taken up. Now, go with me to the very first verse of Acts 1, okay? And, and Luke writes these words. The first account I compose, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Okay, now let's, let's stop there just a moment. Luke says, Theophilus, Jesus was taken up. He was gone to heaven. He was ascended, which we saw that and we'll see again in a moment. But he says, before that, before the ascension, he did something. And according to verse 2, what he did was he gave them orders. Gave them orders. Now, it simply says, until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders. Okay, now, that word orders is a, is a wonderful word. 
uh, it, it means a command but it's a command that's fixed it's it's a command that you that you don't question uh, it, it's a command that that you say okay this is th this is the command and therefore I do uh, it's a command of authority um, I was reminded last night uh, we had our, our uh, boys over uh, and uh, some grandsons and we were watching OU football game last night on TV and uh, I was reminded, because there were, what, 20,000 people there rather than 80,000 or something, and it looked kind of like some of the practices back in the day when Stoops was there and, 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 and Barry and all those guys. And, and one time when Jerry and I were young, uh, we, went, we went to a practice, an OU practice, and actually it was a red and white game, and, but, but, but they're kind of practicing. And I, and I will never forget, there was some young kid, and he was, he was receiving kicks, and he must have been a freshman or sophomore, and, and Stoops was a coach. And, and whatever he did, Coach Stoops didn't like it. As far as I concerned, he just caught the ball. But whatever he did, Stoops didn't like it. And so you're close enough, sitting down, that you can hear him talking. And, and, and so Stoops said to him, do that again. So they get it back to the guy. He kicks the ball. And this young man, whatever he did, he did it again. And Coach Stoops goes up to him and gets his helmet and says, do you not know who I am? I am Bob Stoops, your coach. Now, folks, that's an order. That, that's exactly the word. And when Jesus gives orders to the apostles, although he didn't say it just like that, he could have. It was an order that was fixed. Okay, now, that makes me want to know what he say. What was this order? Man, this is pretty serious stuff. All right? So, so he gives them an order. Now, notice that the order or the command was given by the Holy Spirit. In, in fact, you'll see this until the day, verse 2, when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders. All right, so by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's working through him. He's given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, I, I want to I call your attention to, to another word. The apostles whom he had chosen. The apostles whom he had chosen. Now, that word chosen... Is a, is a critical word. It, it literally means, and this is important, to choose out of others. To choose out of others. Okay, so he gave orders to these men, these apostles, whom he had chosen out of others. So, so there, there were others he could have chosen, but he didn't. He chose these. There are others who could have been selected, but he didn't. These are the ones that were selected. Now, that, that word chosen also carries the idea of having authority over somebody. Okay, so he chose these men understanding that he had authority over them. They were under his control. They were under his direction. He chose them. Now, now, now here's what's, what's interesting. Uh, if, if, if I am going to go buy a car... And, and I've got, there's a group of cars there, and they're all kind of what I want, but there's one of them, for whatever reason, I say, I want that one. Well, I choose that. Okay, well, at that point then, once I sign the papers and I pay the deal, at that point, that car is mine. The others don't matter to me at all. Doesn't matter what the other cars do, but that car is mine. And that car is to respond to me. It, it, that car is under my authority. Okay, now that's, that's the word, folks. See, now that, that, stay with this. It's really interesting just a moment. Okay, because Jesus chose those apostles. He chose them out of others. Now, um, I, I want you to see something. Because now remember, we're talking about how do we let Jesus change us. We accept his authority. Okay, now, take your Bible and, and go with me over to Ephesians. And, and we're just going to hit this very quickly. But go with me over to Ephesians chapter 1. And I, and I just want you to see something, okay? Go with me, Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, you'll find that. Galatians, Ephesians. 
uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and, and listen to what Paul writes, okay? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now look, just, <coughs> excuse me, just as He chose us. Same word that Luke uses in Acts. He chose those apostles, chose them out of others, being under His authority, all right? So Paul says, just as He chose us in Him, look at this, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless <clears throat> before Him. Now, we could talk a lot about choosing and all that stuff, which one day we'll do, but, but that's not really my emphasis right now. My emphasis is, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, according to what Paul just said to us, God chose you before the foundation of the earth. I know you responded to him, all that kind of stuff we'll talk later. But according to, to this scripture, God chose you before the foundation of the earth. God chose me before the foundation of the earth. He chose us, listen to this, He chose us out of others. Now that's interesting. He chose us out of others. Okay, so, so just as He chose the apostles, I'm not saying we're apostles, okay, but just as He chose the apostles, He chose us, and He put them under His authority, and He put us under His authority. And I'm convinced that, boy, if we really want to change, we accept His authority. We, we, we take His Word, and we say, God, You have said that. I, I will follow that. I, will, I don't have to understand it. I don't have to even understand all the Word. I, but I know what You've said, and whatever You've said in Your Word, I will respond to I, you have chosen me, and I'm under your authority. So, uh, and, and by the way, people I've noticed over the years who really grow in the Lord, they don't have any trouble with the authority of the Lord. They don't have any trouble with that. I mean, they, they, they just they place their life under His authority. Whatever He says, they respond to. There's no problem with His authority. Okay, now let's look at a second point. Not only... <clears throat> Did they accept his authority? Jesus' authority must be accepted. But, but I love this. Jesus' resurrection must be applied. His resurrection must be applied. Now, folks, I want to I ask you a question. And, and, you, and, and I, know how, I know your answer to this, okay? Is Jesus alive? Yeah. Yeah, he's alive. Well, how alive? He's really alive, right? Is he as alive as me? Yeah, actually he's more alive. Is, is he as alive as you? Yeah, more alive. But have we ever just taken his resurrection and just applied it? I, I have a Lord who is alive. I have a Lord who speaks to me. I have a Lord who by His Spirit directs me. I have a Lord who lives in me. Now, I, I want you to notice the way Luke says this. Go with me now, back to Acts chapter 1, verse 3. All right? And, 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 and listen to this. To these... Okay, now who's the these? That's, that's those people that were gathered. That's those apostles and some ladies and some other. This is going to be the people that will be in the upper room later, okay? This is the people that are going to experience the Holy Spirit later. All right, so to these, all right, to these, he also presented, let's stop right there. That word presented is a beautiful word. Um, it, it means to stand beside, um, to exhibit, uh, to prove, um, I, um, I, I enjoy cars, and I enjoy car shows. And here several years ago, <clears throat> I was at a car show in Tulsa, 
a big trailer pulled up, a uh, tractor trailer type thing. And on the side of the trailer, it, it just simply said, uh, Church Hill's car. That's all it said, Church Hill's car. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And so they pulled that trailer up and they dropped the back end of that trailer. And this guy goes around to the front side, goes to the little door, gets in the car that's in there, and they back out this beautiful Rolls Royce that had been Churchill's car in London during the war. Now, you could have the side, you could have the name on the side, you could have the truck, you'd have all the stuff, but, but there was nothing that proved that until they backed it out. You say, well, that could have been anybody's Rolls Royce. No, because they showed you all the papers. And they just, they just kept adding proof upon proof. This was Churchill's car. Okay, now, now folks, listen. That, that word present means they just added proof upon proof that he was alive. They, he exhibited himself. He stood beside them. He proved himself. Now look at all the ways he did this. To these, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. That word convinced there means infallible. Okay, now, but keep in mind, Luke is saying, Theophilus, I'm telling you, the man's alive. This is from eyewitnesses. Remember, I told you that earlier. This is from eyewitnesses who told me all these things. And they, he was, he's alive, he infallibly alive. There is no doubt. They're, they're stacking proof upon proof. He presented himself. Now, now look at this. Appearing to them over a period of 40 days. Now, now, now think about that. Forty days. Day one, day two, day three, day four. Forty days. He presented himself over a period. Of, in other words, he didn't... Listen, the first time they saw him was not the last time they saw him in those forty days. They'd seen him over and over. He had appeared to them over and over. He had spoken to them. Look at this. This is interesting. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, now stop right there. Um, he appeared to them for 40 days and he spoke to them for 40 days. He didn't just appear and leave. He, he, he appeared. And, and, and you know, I, I, uh, Warren Wiersbe wrote a little book years ago called Preaching with Creativity. And, and I kind of like to teach with creativity. I, I, I see Jesus appearing and, and teaching some things. And maybe the next day he, he, he appears again and says, Hey, I, there's some more stuff I want you to know. And, and then he appears again. There's, there's some other things. So 40 days he's, he's coming and he's appearing and he's teaching and he's just presenting himself alive. And, 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 and it's just the most amazing truth here that Jesus shows he's alive. So, so for 40 days, uh, over and over, <clears throat> he presents himself and he teaches. And notice what he teaches about. Speaking the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God, what is that? That's not just heaven. The kingdom of God is him ruling. The kingdom of God is him sovereignly ruling our lives. We, we are a part of his kingdom. We're not of this world. We, we have to live here and we have an assignment here that we'll talk about here in a moment. And there's things we're to do and things we're to accomplish. And, but but uh, let, me, let me ask you, do y'all not sometimes get a little hungry for the kingdom of the Lord? Find yourself saying, man, I'm tired of this deal. I'm ready for this thing to be over. Well, see, what is that? That's because we're not of this world. We're of His kingdom. So for 40 days, Jesus appears over and over and over and over and over and He teaches about the kingdom and He teaches about the kingdom and He teaches about the kingdom. Now, Luke says, those eyewitnesses, I met them. I heard from them. So is there any doubt Jesus is alive? No. I tell you, folks, if the Romans could have proved Jesus wasn't alive, they would have. If there's any way they could have proved he wasn't alive, 
if the Pharisees could have proved anyway, he wasn't. They would have. Okay, so 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 here we have our resurrected Lord. But but have we applied that to, to our lives? See, I, I've just discovered over the years when I when I stop and think about the resurrected Lord speaking to me from His Word. When I think about the resurrected Lord by His Spirit convicting me of my sin. When I think about the living Lord wanting to direct me and live through me and and take my life and make it like His life, boy, I want to change. See? And so, so I'm convinced, obviously, we're going to see uh, next week, we'll begin to see the, the, the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit come into the lives of these people. And I know that was supernatural change. I understand there's supernatural power going on there. And we're going to deal with that. But I think there's something in these folks that was, we have a living Lord. See? Now, there, there's, a, there's a final truth that I, that I want us to see. And, and we talked about that, that we must understand that, that, that He's alive. We talked about the fact of His authority must be accepted. But, but now here's the, the last truth for this morning. Jesus commands, now we, we saw His authority, His commands, His orders. Jesus commands must be followed. All right, so if I'm going to change, if my life is going to change, I've got to take His commands. I mean, after all, He's the one of authority. He chose me. He chose me out of others. He's the one who has my life. He's the one of authority. So, so therefore, I'm going to follow His commands. Boy, that'll change me, amen? That'll begin to... I'm just going to follow His commands. Now, look at what happens beginning in verse 4. Gathering them together. Okay, so Jesus and Luke is telling Theophilus, here's what happened. This is the eyewitness account. He gathered them together. He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. All right, so he says, the Father, what the Father had promised, you can, you can read about that later in John 14, 26. The Father had promised that he was going to send to them another comforter. All right, that's the Holy Spirit. And, and, and the, 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 the word another means one just like me. One well, just like me. So he's, the, boy, that's an amazing thought. Just like him, Holy Spirit has all of his authority. Holy Spirit has all of his life. Holy, as Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God. So he says, I, I'm going to send one just like me. All right, now, now look at what he says. Gather them together. He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him. Now this is interesting. We'll hit this real quickly. Jesus will not let them be distracted off this. He he will not let them go anywhere else. Look at this, verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring your kingdom to Israel? Are, Are now you getting ready to be king? Jesus not interested in that. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times and epochs which the Father has fixed by His own authority. So you don't need to know that. The Father's fixed that. That's a done deal. That's coming. But you don't need to know that. And and it's almost, and I don't want to read into the Scripture here, but but it's almost like Jesus said, look, you don't need to know that, but here's what you need to know. Don't worry about that, but here's what you need to worry about. Okay, verse verse 7, or verse 8, excuse me. But you shall receive power... When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Okay, now folks, that, 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 there's a great doctrine there that maybe sometime we'll, we'll have more time to really talk about. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, the grammar of verse 8, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, the grammar says that's a one-time event. Okay? The Holy Spirit came upon you at salvation. The word upon means to influence, to attack, to be over. The Holy Spirit came up on you, all right? And that will, you, you don't, you never lose the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not come up on you again. Holy Spirit may convict you. The Holy Spirit may deal with you. Holy Spirit may teach you. But the Holy Spirit comes up on you at salvation. And from that moment on, He influences you, 
Okay? So it's not like he comes and goes. And I know we hear things about that. But let's just see what the Bible says. And the Scripture says that when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even the remotest part of the earth. Now, um, it, it, it's so interesting, his command at this point. He says, you'll be my witnesses. That word witnesses, means it can mean martyr. You, you will give your life for me. But really, it means you're going to speak. You're going to tell people about me. Now, folks, let me, let me make a bold statement here, okay? A witness does not just live their life before others. They've got to speak it. If you're, if you're a witness in a trial and you say to the judge and the attorneys, well, I'm just, I'm just going to live my life before you. I'm just going to live my testimony before you. They will say, no, wait a minute. You need to tell us some things. You know, we've fallen into a trap here today, and a lot of people say, well, I'm just going to live my life before the world. I'm just, I'm just going to love people to Jesus. I understand that. I know what they're saying. But, folks, a witness has to speak. We've got to tell people. There's a verbal thing going on here that has to... We've got to tell people about how to be saved. We've got to tell people about how to know Jesus. And he says you do it everywhere. Jerusalem, Judea, and to the end of the earth. That word in there is the word eschatol, where we get our word eschatology, the study of end time things. You go to the very end of the earth. In other words, everywhere you tell it. Everywhere you let people know. Now, at that point, look, look carefully at verse 9. After he had said these things, okay, so now he's through talking. Forty days he'd been teaching, and now he says to them, <clears throat> the last thing I want you to know, my last words to you, is you shall be my witnesses. That's my last words to you. Okay, but now look at this. After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on. So they're seeing this now. He's lifted up. And they're looking on. Now, look at how the Scripture says this. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Now look at verse 10. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, I bet they were gazing intently. Can, 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 have you ever, again, I like to teach with creativity, you ever thought about what that might have looked like? I mean, here he is, he's beside him, he's with them. You know, he's, 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 he's close to them. And, and, and then he gets through and he begins to raise up. And all of a sudden, they notice his feet are at eye level. And he continues to go up. Scripture says a cloud received him. You think maybe they were... I, I, I still see him. There he is. You see him? You see him? There he is. I think there's a lot going on there. And while that's happening, this is amazing. They were looking at him intently in the sky while he was going, and behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. That doesn't mean they're out there somewhere floating around the sky stood beside them, right there by them, stood beside them, and they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? <laughs> you think maybe they said, Are you kidding? Do you see just what we saw? And why they... And, and this Jesus... Now, now, folks, listen, in your Bible, mark those words, this Jesus. It literally says, This same Jesus. Jesus, the very same Jesus, this Jesus who's been taken up from you into heaven will come just in the same way as you watched him go into heaven. As he went in the cloud, that very same Jesus, that alive Jesus, that authoritative Jesus, that resurrected Jesus, that Jesus appeared to them 40, for 40 days and taught them, that very same Jesus not a figment of the imagination, not something the computer draws up, that very same Jesus will come again just as you saw him leave. 
So as they saw him leave in the clouds, we will see him come in the clouds. Okay? All right, now, he left them commands. And, and what do we see them doing? Going back to Jerusalem, waiting, doing exactly as he said. So how do we have a life that Jesus changes? Well, we, 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 we take him as the authority the one that chose us out of others. And we understand He is the resurrected Lord. And we follow His commands. And boy, I tell you, brothers and sisters, if, if that becomes our life, we won't ever be one of these flatline folks. Boy, we'll be changing and growing and developing. It'll be amazing what God does in our lives. Well, I, I want to lead us in prayer. And uh, Randy's going to come in and dismiss us right quick, and uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll be through. Thanks for coming today, and uh, uh, share with others what we're doing, particularly new folks in the church, and maybe folks that don't have a Bible group. Share with them what we're doing, uh, and uh, we'll we'll just watch God do what He wants to do among us. Amen. Thanks for coming. Let's uh, let's pray together. All right, Father, uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. God, I pray we'd be people that you change. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you did not.